It's Sunday morning, and we are on the subject of the bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. But that's not the only place that it's mentioned. And uh, we're over here in the 20th chapter of Revelation. We started on Mother's Day, and we went into a study of our mother, which is Jerusalem. Our mother is Jerusalem, according to Galatians, the fourth chapter. And we found that our mother was the tree of life, the same thing as the church. The tree of life is the church, and I'm not going to go through all that. And we ended up over there in the 22nd chapter of Revelation with the tree of life. And we had the tree of life over there in the second and third chapter of Genesis. And it's the same tree of life. We found out the tree of life was the olive tree. And the olive tree is the church according to the 11th chapter of Revelation. We found the tree of life in Proverbs 3.18 and Proverbs 11.30, Proverbs 13 and 12, and Proverbs 15 and 4. And a tree of life is wholesome words or uncorrupt word of God. Now, this took us to the fact that the 22nd chapter of Revelation is about the church. It's not about a future happening. It's about the church because we saw in verse 2 that the leaves, that the tree of life, which bear 12 fruit, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And the key there is the word nations, which is the word ethnos. And ethnos means non-Jews. So this tree of life would be for non-Jews or Gentiles. Therefore, it couldn't be a thousand-year reign, and it couldn't be eternity. That means only Gentiles could eat of this during the thousand-year reign, and they could only eat of it during eternity. We don't believe in a thousand-year reign here. We don't believe that it's the word thousand. I'm not going to go into that right now. I'll go into that later on. We believe it, it is the word kili. It's plural. And of course, a uh, thousand is singular to the mind of the Greeks in the first century. Uh, one was a, not a number. It was a generator of numbers. And any multiple of ten, a hundred, or a thousand was a form of the original number. Uh, ten, a hundred, or a thousand is a form of one. And when they were thinking in incre increments of a thousand, that was singular. Well, well, uh, that word thousand is not the word thousand. It's the word kilia, and it's plural. Therefore, it has to be 2,000 or more, and there's been a 2,000-year period uh, from Christ until, until the end of time, end of time, that, uh, and there's no thousand-year reign, and, no, and there is an eternity, but that comes at the end of time. And there was a time where the Gentiles are not be able to be deceived. That's from Acts 2 until the end of time. And that is Kilia, or the 2,000 year, where the Gentiles will not be able to be deceived, or the ethnos, nations, nations. And it amazes me when you get to, the, when you get to this word ethnos, it means Gentiles, or it means non-Jews. Therefore, it couldn't be the thousand years, so-called thousand years, it couldn't be eternity. So it has to be the time which we're living right now, which is where God will pour out of his spirit on all flesh, our red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh, and he gave his truth to one flesh, all to the Old Testament, the Jewish flesh, and nobody else. In fact, he gave his truth only to the Jews over here. Truth, or let me put it this way, he gave knowledge, and that's what the bottomless pit is about. It's no knowledge. Is no knowledge, and he's only giving his truth to the Gentile elect church, church here for the last 2,000 years. You say, I, I thought the year 2000 was up. No, uh, in Acts 2, that was around 35 A.D., and the year 2000 won't be here until somewhere around 2035 A.D., but the calendar's off, so you can't trust any of our calendars. We're living somewhere uh, four to 17, 18 years later than our calendar because the calendar was redone by Dionysius, a Scythian monk uh, that was commissioned by the Roman Catholic Church to redo, the, to redo this calendar. And uh, we don't know exactly. There are no calendars that are exact, not a solar calendar, Julian calendar, not a lunar calendar, not a Gregorian calendar. We don't know exactly where we're living, but somewhere in the neighborhood of Actually, 2016 on up towards the late 2020s, we're living somewhere in that time period, but we're not really sure 
the best chronologist cannot come up with something proper on that. Now, what this has done, we've seen that not only is the 22nd chapter of Revelation, but the 21st chapter and the 20th chapter is about the church, New Testament church. Let's go back over to the 20th chapter. And we got into this thing on the bottomless pit. It's not a bottomless pit. Uh, let's read it here. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold. Now it says the key to the bottomless pit, not a bottomless pit. There's only one bottomless pit, and it's not the word bottomless pit. It is the word abusos, A-B-U-S-S-O-S. And abusos comes from the word bathos, means something with depth, depth, or it can be intellectual knowledge in depth. Now, we, I'm going to remind you of some of the things I said. When you place the alpha in front of a word as a negative particle, it's called the alpha privative. Alpha privative. And the alpha privative negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. We use the same thing in asexual, not sexual, or atypical. I use these plus some others. Not typical, atypical. Well, abusas or abathos translates abusas. It means a place of no intellectual knowledge or no depth. Now, it cannot possibly, impossible to mean a nuclear explosion with a hole in the ground, mainly because of what comes out of the bottomless pit. What comes out of the pit or the place of no knowledge, we just got through saying, over here, the Gentile world didn't have any knowledge of God, and God has revealed it to us as starting in Acts 2, but they didn't have any knowledge over here in the Old Testament. Uh, only the Jews had the truth over here, or one flesh, one flesh, and during the last days when Peter stood at Pentecost and he said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days the Lord will pour out of his Spirit, the Holy Spirit is truth, on all flesh, the truth will be on all flesh, and thy word is truth. The word was not given over here, so therefore the Gentiles were in a place of no knowledge. They were in the pit, but the Gentiles were... They were serving the world beast system. Remember, as I've said, the Lord said to Israel, if you're not obedient to me when I give you this land of Israel, and I'll give you this land, he gave it to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And then Joseph was in bondage, and Israel was in bondage 40 years, and uh, excuse me, 400 years, and they were 40 years in the wilderness. Then they come back to the land, and judges rule in the land, Judges rule until kings begin to rule in First Samuel. In First Samuel, the kings begin to rule, and through Second Chronicles, the kings rule. And God tells Moses when they leave the land after forty years in the wilderness, He gives them a law at the beginning of that journey of forty years, and He says, "If you're not obedient to Me when you come back to the land that I've given to Abraham your father, I'm going to send four judgments. I'm going to send the sword. That's war. War." And I'm going to send the, the famine, and that will come in the form of no rain, or things like locusts, locust. And he said, I'll send the pestilence, that's all kinds of disease. And he said, the last thing I'll send, I'll send these three over and over and over again. And for 500 years, while they were a nation, from 1 Samuel, 2nd, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, he kept sending these judgments of sword, famine, and pestilence, finally said, I'll send the beast, which is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. It's the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, and there's reasons for that. We've said that. And the Roman beast with iron teeth. Iron teeth. Now, there's something specific about iron. Iron was said to be taboo in the ancient world by many. This was the strongest of metals in the ancient world. So he sends the beast in. He sends the Babylonian lion to come in. Babylon was the most regal of all the empires, and the lion was the most regal of animals in this ancient world, and he was the king of the beast. And, and Babylon is equated with a lion. So the lion carries Israel away into captivity, and Assyria 
which is a part of ba the Babylonian system, carried northern Israel in 722 B.C., 722, and this and then Babylon carried southern Judah in 586 B.C., and then Babylon is overthrown by Persia Mede Empire, and that's a dual empire. They were overthrown by the Persians and the Medes in 539, 539 B.C., and of course the Persians and the Medes give the four decrees to rebuild to rebuild uh, the temple and to rebuild the city. And then the Persian and the Medes are overthrown by Alexander the Great around 330 B.C. Alexander the Great has four generals, uh, Lysacomus, Lysacomus, Cassander, Cassander, Seleucus. And it's believed that one of these generals had Alexander the Great assassinated. He was a very young man when he was killed. And he was living in Babylon. And Ptolemy. And the Ptolemies were the Egyptians. Egyptian Seleucus. Seleucus got the what's called the lion's share of the empire. And he was the most powerful of these emperors. And out of Seleucus would, become the, would come the Antiochian. Antiochus kings. You had Antiochus the god. Antiochus the great. And you had Antiochus Epiphanes. And we get the word Antioch. They named their cities after their names. And Antiochus Epiphanes... Epiphanes, uh, he, was, he was the picture in the Old Testament in Daniel 11, Daniel 11, of the man of sin. Man of sin. Man of sin is an office. If you have the... And this is the leader of the world ruling system. The world ruling system is called the beast. And you find that beast in Daniel 7, Daniel 7, the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and the beast comes up out of the bottomless pit or comes out of the place of no knowledge. The beast didn't have any knowledge of God. Only Israel had knowledge of God. The beast had its borders upon the sea, and the sea is identified with the bottomless pit. You see, Jim, you said that. I'm setting this thing up to go further into what we've been studying. The beast is a world-ruling system. There's going to be a world-ruling system at the end of time. It might be the Trilateral Commission. It might be a combination of that with the Bilderberg Group. It may be this, uh, this uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and we'll go into that. These are efforts, or the North American, uh, the North American Union, or the European Union. All of these are efforts being made by the elite of the world, by bankers, by presidents and premiers to bring about a world ruling system or a new world order. And this has been in the making all this past century. The League of Nations was an effort to start this. And then in 1923, they started the Council on Foreign Relations. This is, was a way to try to control world governments and world spending and economy. And they still have the, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations. And back in 1954, they began the European Union, which was an amalgamation of all these European states, they're saying that they can't get along any other way. Now, as, And some people say these are all conspiracies. The point is, whether they're conspiracies or not, well, when you conspire to do something, let me read something to you. Most people say they're not conspiracies. If you go, on, if you go online and look up Bilderberg Group, now I've got DVDs on the Bilderbergs. It is a secret society it's a secret meeting of presidents and premiers and the Queen of England and the President of the United States and senators and power heads and power structures to bring about a to bring about a world system of rule. It's not like a man that's conspiring is sitting back going, ha, 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 we're going to do something evil. To conspire, let me read the word conspire and we get the word conspiracy from it. It means to breathe together, to agree. That's all it means. And it can be a plan or act together secretly. It can be to commit a crime or to commit something good. To combine or work together for any purpose or effect. Well, we know that the Bilderberg Group met in the Bilderberg Hotel back in 1954. And they started the Bilderberg Organization of trying to amalgamate the systems of the world. We had the League of Nations back in the 20s. We had the 
Council on Foreign Relations back in 23 that was organized in the same type of effort to bring the nations of the world together into one system. We had the North American Union, which uh, met in 2005, and you go to the Internet and look up North American Union, and you can see back in 2005 some of the anchor men saying there's an effort being made to make Mexico, Canada, and the United States one sovereign state. Once they get this done, you have an Asian Union. You have an Asian Union trying to amalgamate the Asian states. You have the EEC, the European Ec Economic Community, and all of these have been organized. The, you have the Trilateral Commission that was put together in 1973. These are all efforts to bring the world into one system of government. This is not just something recent. It's, it's the same thing that Hitler was doing with the Third Reich of the Third Thousand Years. He was going to make one world system. This has been an effort on the part of the people. Now, as far as conspiring... Let me say something real simple. As far as conspiring to do something evil, do I believe the rich men of the world are conspiring to do something evil? Well, the love of money is the root of all evil, and they love the money, but they like to get together secretly. The Bilderberg group gets together secretly. Trilateral Commission meets secretly. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations meets secretly. And they say it's for the good of the world. They're not sitting there cackling, acting, acting evil and twitching their mustaches like evil men. That's why whenever, if you go online, look up the Bilderberg Group, and you'll see them meeting in these hotels. They met in Toronto, Canada recently. And these are world power structure men, money men from all over the world. The Rothschild, the uh, J.P. Morgan and his bunch. This is going on in America. It's blind and dumb and deaf to actually what's going on. As to whether they're conspiring, do I believe they're conspiring to do evil things well only the sense of money but men aren't saying let's do something evil they're saying we need to put the world together and have everyone getting along and we need to stop all of this we need to have everyone tolerating one another and have political correctness and we'll have a world religion and you can have your religion but you cannot uh you cannot uh, uh put down anyone else and we'll all get along and we'll we'll amalgamate finally if we get a and I'm not saying this is going to happen exactly this way, but here's the point. There is a world beast system that's going to rise up at the end of time. If it's not the United Nations, and it's not the Council on Foreign Relations, and if it's not the Trilateral Commission, it's not the Bilderbergs, who is it? Huh? These are the most powerful men in the world meeting now. Did you know that? Everybody's heard of the Bilderberg. Raise your hand. Most people here know about it. You heard of the Trilateral Commission? Council on Foreign Relations. It's, it's going on right now. And they are the most powerful men in the world. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to save the euro dollar in Europe. They're trying to amalgamate a Northern American system and pull Mexico. And I don't believe it's just the idea of pulling Mexico, the United States, and Canada together and obliterating our borders. It is so that once we get together, then we can join the World Union. We can be together with the, the EEC or the European Union, along with the Asian Union, and then we'll be able to put the world together and have a one world order or a beast world system. It's got to come from somewhere. The Bible teaches the beast is going to rise up in the end of time, and it's going to be about economy. Is there any, is there any problem with the economy in the world? The EEC is trying to save itself right now. They're trying to hold itself up. Italy's trying to borrow money to save Spain. And they don't have any way to pay it back. And Greece is sinking and the whole economy is collapsing around us. And the beast is about buying and selling, isn't it? Isn't that what it's about? Well, guess where that started? In the garden, Eve saw a tree that was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye. It would make her wise. And this is all that's in the world, in the world. And John said, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, good for food, lust of the eye, pleasant of the eye, pride of life. It would make her wise. She could, be, she could be proud of herself. And what is all that's in the world? Isn't that about buying and selling? And the serpent was ruling in the garden. And when you start ruling, you vote against God and throw him out. We're talking about the beast rises up out of the place of no knowledge. 
it has no knowledge of God, if they come up and they want to, and they, if the beast or the world system, it is the trilateral commission, if it is the Bilderbergs and the Council on Foreign Relations, all coming together in one world system and the United Nations, and that was, and it started with the League of Nations, an effort to bring the world system together. It's going on right now, and most of the world is deaf and dumb to what's happening. Did you know that? Would the Arabs go along with that and the oil people? Everything, is, uh, everything that has to do with buying and selling and money is what it's about. We're sitting on the verge of something happening, and our economy is collapsing. One of the papers I got off the Internet says we actually owe 99.2 trillion dollars. They hide that from us, too. They say it's 14 trillion. We'll never pay off 14 trillion, much less 99 trillion. What I'm getting at, whether it's a conspiracy or not, in the sense of an evil conspiracy, that's why when the Bilderbergs meet, and these guys with bullhorns out there saying, we're going to save our nation, we're going to get you Bilderbergs, and they're out there with these big bullhorns doing this. You're not going to save nothing, and they're not going to destroy it. God's going to destroy it. There is going to be a world beast system rise up, whether it's the Trilateral Council for Foreign the Bilderbergs, North American Union, European Union, Asian Union, whatever. It looks like it's all of these coming together, United Nations, and the United States will have to use, lose its sovereignty. And the way you lose your sovereignty is you go bankrupt. You know Pulaski, Tennessee went bankrupt, didn't you, back years ago. And what you do is you go under the nearest form of government. We would go under the nearest form of government, which would be what? The United Nations? We are bankrupt, basically. The whole world is bankrupt. The economy has fallen, and we're collapsing all over the world. We're not coming out of this recession. Forget it. It's not going to happen. Now, it's about the beast. I only said that. I may go more into these, these various systems, but all the big boys are members of this. Cheney was one of the big heads of it. David Rockefeller is the head. David Rockefeller is the big boss man of the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, he is the man on the top of the world. He is the power man. Now, he's an old man, and he's going to die, but he'll leave it in the hands of somebody else. And kind of what David Rockefeller says, he makes Nelson Rockefeller look like Ned in the first reader when it comes to power. He wields the power worldwide. And what he says and what the Rothschilds say that's what goes in the world. These men are running the banks of the world. It's the banks. One of the Rothschilds said, I, he said, give me the power to print money and I don't care who makes the rules and the laws. He said the money rules and that's the fact. Money buys off everything. Now, let's get back to this world beast system. The beast, which is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome, which is a system of no knowledge of God, rises up out of the pit there, rises up out of this place of no knowledge, rises up in, the beast rises up in, uh, in Revelation 11, and the, and the scorpions, which are false teachers, rise up out of Revelation 9, and Satan is bound in this place of no knowledge, or bound away from the church, Let's just pretend that Israel is the church because that's what it is. I'm talking about literal Israel on this map. Let's just say that this is a picture of the church here and here's the beast out here. And the church has the knowledge of God because we have ears to hear. The hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord has made even both of them. The rest of the world has no knowledge of God. And instead of being a beast that rises up with its borders on the Mediterranean Sea, it's a worldwide system now that's why the Bible says Babylon is fallen, is fallen in Revelation 18 and 2. It's fallen once over there in, in Jeremiah, the 50th and 51st chapter of Jeremiah. It's fallen once over there in the 44th chapter and 45th chapter of Isaiah. It's fallen once in the 13th, 14th chapter of Isaiah. And it will fall again as the world system of self and money and things and stuff, and we are going down and going to the bottom. And the only thing that's going to save this is Jesus Christ coming back 
in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. He's coming back one day. And he is the one that's going to solve this. This America is going down. The guys on the right over here to say, got the bullhorns, we're going to bring you down world system. No, you're not. God's going to raise it up and he will destroy it when he comes back. Now let's talk about this beast world system. Satan is bound in the bottomless pit here in verse 1 where he's bound away from the Gentiles. And it says the same thing as that 22nd chapter. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound Dio, forbid him. Dio, forbid him for 2,000 years. And it goes on to say, and bound him, 2,000 years, I want to put it in there, and cast him into the place of no knowledge, the bottom of his pit, and shut him up to set a seal upon them that he should deceive the nations no more, or the non-Jews till the 2,000 years is finished. It's the only thing that works in this situation. It says 1,000, but it's not 1,000. They didn't count the way we count. Why the trans- You know why the translators didn't know that? Half of them are Roman Catholic and half of them were Protestants, and they knew nothing about translating numbers. Now, I've done a study on these numbers from entomology of mathematics, and that's what... The etymologists say in the first century, one was not a number, it was a generator of numbers. A multiple of 10, 100, and 1,000 was a form of the original number, one. They didn't start counting until they got to two. So plural, kilia, would have to be 2,000 or more. And most scholars believe it's more than 1,000. We certainly couldn't be, well, I'm not going to know why it couldn't be. I've already gone through it. Now, so he wouldn't deceive the nations anymore till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must lo- be loosed a little season. Now, I'm not going to go into the little season of Satan. If that's merely the apostasy. Loosed a little season is the apostasy, apostasis. And we find that in, over there in the, find that in the uh, second chapter, Second Thessalonians, verse 3. The day of the Lord will not come except to come a falling away and apostasis a removal of standing upright or removal of a cross, the daily cross, as well as the exclusive cross of Christ. People don't believe in the exclusive cross. They don't believe that Jesus died only for his wife. Now, out of the pit comes... I want to start back where we, where we were last week. Out of the pit... I said that down here that these generals, Seleucius... These are the the four generals, Ptolemy. These are the four generals that took over Alexander the Great's empire. Seleucus, out of the Seleucians would come the Old Testament man of sin, which will be the head of the world beast system. There's going to be a man rise up at the end of time. He's going to say, I have the answer that the world is looking for. I can answer the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. I can answer. I have the answer for wars. If we can amalgamate the world into one system, then whoever's ahead of that system can control wars. They can control the tri- economy. And, I, and most of the, the men who write about these guys say they want America in debt. They want America busted and broke because they want to be able to control. They want to control the system. Now, I want us to look back. Now, we're talking about the beast. The beast is like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Let's go back to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Back to Daniel, the seventh chapter. This beast comes out of the bottomless pit or the place of no knowledge. And I'm going to continue where we, where we were. This, let me go ahead and, uh, j- let, me, let me go back to Revelation 13. Back to Revelation 13. And then I'll go back to Daniel 7. Sometimes I don't know exactly how to put it all together. It's so much information that I just put it together as we can. It's a bunch of puzzles to the picture. It's a big mosaic. In Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. And all this depicts his power. That's what it, horns means power. And upon his head's the name of blasphemy, 
And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And it says his feet. It's not his, it's its. I said it last week. Wherever you find his all through here, it's the word A-U-T-O-U. A-U-T-O-U. Now that's just a form of A-U-T-O-O. Auto or A U T Ada or A U T O M A I or various other. It's just, it's our word auto, which is the word self. Self. Now, A U T O U will either be neuter gender or it'll be masculine. They have translated it masculine to his and him. But it has to follow the, it has to follow the gender either masculine or feminine or neuter, of the antecedent. The antecedent is all the hymns and his is what it refers back to. It refers back to the beast, which is the word in the Greek, tolerion. Tolerion is neuter gender, so all the hymns and the his is have to be by necessity. They must. The antecedent is the noun or pronoun it refers back to. Jim is the preacher. He... Uh, Preaches Sunday. He refers back to Jim. So all the hymns and his is refer back to the beast. And since the beast is neuter gender, this has to be an it. So it should read this way. It's, and not only for that purpose, but for the fact that it was an it in the Old Testament. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and its feet were as the feet of a bear, and its mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave it its power, its seat, and its great authority. And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. A head was a capital city of an empire. And its deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, or Tolterion. Now, let's go back over here to Daniel, the seventh chapter. Daniel 7. Nothing else is on the horizon rising up while our economy is collapsing. Nothing else is on the horizon rising up to be a beast other than Bilderbergs, Trilateral Commission. Do I believe they're scheming in some way? They're meeting secretly, and it means to meet secretly and plan. And from what I understand, it's against the Constitution to meet and plan governments plan for our government secretly behind the scenes without the people knowing it, without a presidential order, without a congressional order. So what they're doing is against our Constitution. When Cheney, and Mr. Cheney is one of the big heads of this because he's head of Halliburton Oil Company, and he is wanting to fight for his super money, and he's a super rich man, and so are the Bushes. The Bushes are worth billions. They're not worth what the Kennedys are worth. The Kennedys are worth their hundreds of millions. Bushes are worth billions. They make the Kennedys look like paupers. Extremely wealthy people. Yes, they on the news there, uh, like, like Jeff Bates and them, there was uh, uh, something on there about the Kennedys fighting. Yeah, well, they always do that. Uh, look up Bilderberg, Trilateral Commission. Just Google it online. Look up Council on Foreign Relations. Look up North American. Union, look up uh, Asian Union, look up the EU, the European Union, and you'll see there's rising of a system to control world economy, to control world wars, and to take down all the boundaries and the borders of the world so that it can be one world system ruled by one group of small men. And it's a group of these small men that are actually setting the boundaries and the standards for our, and the laws for our system. They even say that our presidents are appointed ahead of time. They know who's going to be president. These power structure and power men set it up. Global warming. They're going to do it over global warming. Too. Well, we're not going to go into that. That's too much. It, it, well, it's more than that. There is the, the earth is definitely heating up. And this is not a Democrat. There's no doubt about that. You, I'm not going to get into global warming. Do I believe the earth heating up? Yes, but it has nothing to do with Democrats. The Bible teaches in Revelation that the earth is going to heat up and that men will curse God for the heat there in Revelation, the 16th chapter. Men will curse God. Do I believe that we're headed towards, I believe we're headed towards the end of all things. Now, let's look over here in Daniel. 
Here's the world beast, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And God says he would meet Israel in Hosea 13 like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream, and visions of his head were upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea. And four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. First was like a lion, and eagle's wings were given unto it. And behold, the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand upon his feet as a man. And a man's heart was given unto it. This was Nebuchadnezzar was struck down in the fourth chapter of this book, on his all fours, for saying, See great Babylon that I have built, and God struck him down on his all fours, and he said, Till you know that the kingdom of this world are given to unto whomsoever God will give it, and he places over these kingdoms the basis to the most low down men who want money and power. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar was raised upon his feet, eagle's wings, they move means they move swiftly, and the Babylonian system moves swift to subdue its enemies. And another beast like unto a second like a bear, the bears the largest carnivore, the largest armies that ever existed, were the Persian armies, or the Persian meat armies. And it raised up on its one side and had three ribs in his mouth. We know that the, we know that the three uh, conquests of the Persian Empire was Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. That was their three conquests. That's why it has three ribs in his mouth. And between the teeth of it they said thus, Unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and though another, another like a leopard. I keep saying, I've studied the leopard. He's a killing machine. He's one of the most dangerous animals in all the forest. He hunts at night. He hunts to kill. He hunts to eat. When he hunts you, you're going to die. A lion may maul you, throw you down to the ground, and may not kill you. A leopard is going after you to eat. He can take a 150, 60-pound man in his mouth, climb to the top of a tree with him. And Alexander the Great, that was that kind of a fighter, and he conquered the Persian Empire that way. After this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon <coughs> the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had four heads. That's the four, that's the four generals that took over when Alexander the Great died. And dominion was given unto it. And after this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, this is Rome, dreadful and terrible and, exceeding, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. This is the head of the world beast system. Back then it would have been the Caesars, the monarchs. At the end of time it will be head of the world system. Some man is going to rise up, smooth talking, charming, not unlike Obama, not unlike Bill Clinton. These two guys are the charmers. I don't know if Bill Clinton can live that long. They're both, well we'll get into them later when we get into this eighth chapter. So, the beast system is the lion, the bear, the leper, and the beast with iron teeth. One other thing about iron. We've said that scorpions were false teachers. Look here in, I'll get back to scorpions. The scorpion rise up, rises up out of the pit. Scorpions, the word scorpios. That's the noun. The verb form of scorpion, scorpizo. That's the word that Jesus used when he said the hireling cares not for the sheep. He allows the wolf, which are false teachers, to come in and scatter the flock. Scatters the verb form of scorpion. Scorpions are false teachers. Ezekiel, you dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words. Ezekiel, the second chapter. Now, <coughs> let me give you something about iron. We see this Daniel, the second chapter. See, Daniel... The seventh chapter. We see Nebuchadnezzar's image that Daniel interprets, the head of gold, head of gold, head. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Thou art that head of gold, Babylon is the head of gold. 
Babylon's the head of gold. Babylon is also the lion. And then he says, after the head of gold comes silver breast. Silver across the breast of this image of Daniel. Breast of silver. Head of gold. That's Babylon. And the silver is, that's the breast. And that is the Persian meat empire. Persian mead. You say, how in the world does this come in at the end of time? This old system was abolished after Rome took over, after the beast with iron teeth. They worshipped sun and tree, iron teeth. And some of the Caesars wouldn't wear the robes of this high priest of the fire worship. So they reinstituted this in the form of Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism. And they placed uh, and, and they renamed all of the icons at Rome they renamed Jupiter Peter Jupiter was Peter they renamed uh, Venus or Aphrodite renamed her Mary and Aphrodite means wrath subduer and Milita means female mediator and Mary became the mediator of Roman Catholicism it but the main thing about it is Roman Catholicism was begun with an edict of toleration. Now, we've got a world system trying to rise up now because of the economy of the world, and they've come up with another name for toleration. They, when uh, Constantine rose up in 325 A.D. at the Nicene Council, for centuries the Romans thought they were going to lose the empire to all these Huns and Vandals and Visigoths, Visigoths, all these hordes rampaging across Europe. So they said, we'll amalgamate their tree worship and their sun worship into the church. And they had outlawed this old, or abolished this old system of fire and tree worship in the pagan Roman Empire. And they reinstituted in the form of Roman Catholicism. Toleration said, we'll tolerate one another. The pagans will tolerate the Christians. The Christians will tolerate the pagans. This is a mixed religion. Now we've updated this tolerance to what's called political correctness. Political correctness is nothing but Roman Catholicism. It's toleration. Political correctness. So we've got political correctness and we've got a world beast system trying to rise up and control the economy. That's the whole idea of the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the North American Union, the EU, the... Uh, all the rest of it, the trilateral commission, that's the whole purpose. As to how they're going to bring it about, I don't know. But it looks like this is what we're building up to, doesn't it? It looks like that's where we're headed. Where else would it come from? Are you going to actually stop these guys that are heads of these great commissions? And these? Are you going to stop these guys and raise up something else in the middle of this? No. It has to come out of these systems, out of the Bilderbergs and the trilateral. Am I... Am I advocating going out here and marching against these guys. No, it's going to happen. If the Bible is true, the world beast system is going to rise up. You guys with your bullhorns trying to stop the Bilderbergs from eating, you're wasting your time. God says it's going to happen, didn't he? It's going to happen, and I don't see where else it could be other than these commissions and, and uh, councils. I don't see where else it could be. It really must be that system rising up. Now, we see that this, that they, in Daniel 2, we see the next system, Persia overthrows Babylon, and then Babylon is overthrown by Greece, Alex the Great, not Assembly of God, Alexander the Great. And then uh, that's the, that's the, uh, torso of brass and that's the torso and then you have the uh, then you have the beast with iron teeth iron notice the iron iron well excuse me legs of iron excuse me legs of iron iron legs and that's Rome 
Rome, iron. And then you have over here the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, and then you have the Grecian leopard, which is the same thing as these over here. And then you have the beast with iron teeth. Iron teeth. So you have iron here, iron here. That is Rome. And remember, a scorpion was a false teacher. Let me give you something over in Revelation. Go back to Revelation real quick, and then we're coming back over here. Revelation, ninth chapter. We see these scorpions, or see these locusts coming up out of the bottomless pit, or out of the place of no knowledge. And these locusts are like scorpions. Locusts just came in the hundreds of billions. They destroyed the food crop of Israel. They did, that was famine. That was one of God's judgments. When you see locusts, think that. And if they're like scorpions, scorpions being false teacher, they steal the the spiritual food, don't they? That's false teachers. Well, it describes the scorpions. I'll get into this later, but I just want you to see one thing over here. Speaking of the scorpions in verse 9, and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. The false teachers actually come out of Babylon, which is a Roman system. A Roman system is actually a Babylonian system. So they are iron, the breastplates of iron. Now, I did some study on scorpions. It's amazing what scorpions do. Scorpions are carnivorous. If you put 100 scorpions into a jar, in about three days, there'll be about 10 or 15. They eat each other. The Babylonian system is a carnivorous system, isn't it? They have the mass. The mass is eating human flesh. That's carnivores. They raise the Eucharist up. They say, Hacus corpus infili, and they say it turns into the literal body and blood of Christ, and you have to eat this flesh and drink this blood. Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. But he tells us what it means. My flesh is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. Indeed is the word alethes. means of truth. It doesn't mean to literally put... It was against God's law in the 17th chapter of Genesis, uh, in Leviticus, to eat blood of any kind, much less human blood. So he says, you eat and drink of truth, and that was an old ancient idiom, eat flesh and drink mud, and it meant to partake in a slaughter. So the scorpions, to tell what family they come from, their breastplates tell what family they're in. That's the Roman system, isn't it? By the way, scorpions... They are carnivores. They eat flesh and drink blood. And scorpions, it's amazing, Babylon was founded on let us make us a name, and they had the stars in the tops of their little ziggurats. Z-I-G-G-U-R-U-T. Ziggurats. These are little stumpy buildings they found in Babylon, and they had the stars in the top, and they studied the stars. And all of the Babylonian system was deified in the stars. Hercules and Venus was nothing but Nimrod, etc. And they plotted everything by the stars. When you look at a book on arachnids, which is eight-legged creatures, spiders and scorpions, the scorpions plot their paths at night by the stars. If you go out to West Texas, if you go out to West Texas, the scorpions plot where they're going by the stars. They have an exoskeleton on the outside and the moon puts some kind of fluorescent, looks like a fluorescent light to the scorpions that they attract their victims by moon. And they worship the moon, didn't they? And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Who, what, what is it that ruled the darkness? The Lord, the, the moon. And they worshiped the Lord moon, and Allah was the crescent moon in the ancient world, 
And you find that on the flags of the Turkish flags. You find it all over the Middle East. And by the way, you find it on the fezes of the Shriners, which is Almina, which is Islamic in origin. We have a mess, don't we? We have a mess. So they have these, and they hide, and they hide in dark places, very patient, waiting to attack an enemy that comes along. And they'll wait, and they'll wait, and they'll wait. I'm trying to tie the praying mantis with something that just destroys the scorpion because the praying mantis is the biggest is the biggest uh, enemy of the scorpion. They'll kill every scorpion that comes along. So I've been working on that. If you ever seen a praying mantis attack a scorpion, the scorpion doesn't have a chance. Maybe it's because he's praying or something. <laughs> Maybe he's, pray, he's praying over his food. Dear Lord, thank you for this scorpion. <laughs> now, these guys that try to make the... When it, when it goes down here, I'm going to get back to this later. But in the earlier part of that chapter 9, when it speaks of they have stings in their tails, uh, in verse 5, them, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment, be tormented five months. What's the five months for? Five months is the length of the life of a locust. Just in case you might want to know. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Usually, when he strikes a man, he strikes him in the foot. Normally. Because you put you, they hide in shoes, they hide in old cans, and they wait in the dark. They hide in the dark, waiting for their prey to come along. That's what preachers do, don't they? They hide in darkness, in a place of no knowledge, waiting for the prey to come along so they can strike them. As he striketh the man, and I'll get into this. I'll even go into torment. I'll go into this later. Uh, I was going to say something. I forgot what it was. Let's go back over here now. So the scorpions come out of the pit. They come out of the bottomless pit. In verse 1 of chapter 9, the fifth angel sound I saw a star fall from heaven. To them was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottom of his pit, and there rose out of the pit a smoke, great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Out of the pit comes the locusts or the false teachers of the people who destroy the food crops that are like scorpions or like false teachers. Oh, I was going to say, when a scorpion stings, and it says they have stings in their tails, these guys who come up, and they try to say these are helicopters like Hal Lindsey. Cobra helicopters. Well, if you got a Cobra helicopter, and here's the, the tail. And here you are. Uh, they're saying in their tails were stings. I'm sorry, but a scorpion doesn't have, and they say that's machine guns shooting at people. It's dumb. A scorpion, when he stings... His tail is up over his head, isn't it? It's over his head. And sometimes when trapped, when a false teacher is trapped, sometimes a scorpion will sting himself and kill himself. If he's trapped in a situation, he'll pop himself in the head while he's trying to attack. It, it can't be stings in the back end of a helicopter. Helicopters don't have, sting, don't have machine guns back here. That's the tail end of the helicopter it would be out of the side of the helicopter my brother-in-law was a crew chief on a helicopter and out of Da Nang in Vietnam and they stood in the side of the helicopter not in the tail of it it's just dumb the things that Hal Lindsey's come up with you know stupid all right now let's go back over here and we'll get back to the scorpions later and what it's about go back over here to Daniel Daniel, how much time do I have? I'm trying to, oh goodness. Now, you, you have represented, you have represented in, uh, well, I'm flipping around here, not paying attention. Sometimes you will have 
something represented in one form in the scripture, and then you'll have it represented as something else. We have Babylon represented as a lion, have Persia represented as a bear, and Greece is a leopard, and let me put something else over here. Let's go to the 8th chapter. The 8th chapter takes us to the end of their kingdom. And when would be the end of this kingdom of the world beast? That would be at the end of time, wouldn't it? Huh? End of time. Let's go to the 8th chapter. Chapter Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, all the same thing. And Daniel 7 is the same as Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And then you find Babylon being overthrown by Persia, by Persia here. You find this happening. You find Babylon carrying Israel into captivity in, uh, in 2 Kings 17. And then you find them carrying them away in 1 Chronicles Chronicles, the 36th chapter. Then you have Persia overthrowing Babylon, overthrowing Babylon. When it overthrows Babylon, it takes over the same system. Even actually has the same fire and tree worship. And Persia overthrows Babylon there in Jeremiah 50 and 51. And in Jeremiah, uh, excuse me, and in Isaiah, Isaiah 13, 14 chapter, and in the 44th and 45th chapter. Excuse me, 45th chapter. 45. And then Greece overthrows Babylon around 330. But that's between the Testaments, so we don't have a biblical, we don't have a biblical account of that. And the Old Testament ends somewhere around 400 B.C. So when Alexander the Great overthrows in 330, B.C., that's the silent years, and then Rome subjugates his generals during that time period, and the Roman Empire is begun by Julius Caesar when he overthrows uh, uh, his enemies, uh, the various generals, uh, and then they're ruling during the New Testament, the beast is ruling, Rome is ruling, people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New. The beast is ruling in the New Testament where Jesus is born. Rome, the beast with iron teeth, is ruling. Isn't it? How in the world can it be different? The judgment of God is upon the earth there. And then, of course, Rome comes along. So what you're going to find is you're going to find these chapters here where Persia overthrows Babylon. Babylon takes Israel into captivity in these chapters here. Now, you have the 8th chapter... Remember, the beast comes out of the bottom of his pit. The beast doesn't come out of a nuclear explosion. Let's read here in chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, let me show you something. This is the third year. Look at chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar. These chapters here are chronologically correct, but look back at chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast of a thousand of his lords, and drank wine before the thousand. Now, I might put Daniel, the fifth chapter here. Also, Daniel 5 goes along with Isaiah 13, 14, uh, Isaiah 44 and 45, and Daniel 5 is about the overthrow of Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is overthrown as the last king of Babylon in this fifth chapter because we see how... He sees the handwriting on the wall that says, Mine, Mine, Tico, Upharsin, in verse 25. And Daniel interprets it and says, Thou art weighed in the balance and found mourning. And that night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain in verse 30. So he's killed in chapter 5. But chapter 7 says in the first year of Belshazzar. Chapter 8 says in the third year of Belshazzar. So chapter 5, the time factor belongs after chapter 8, doesn't it? Can you see that? Shake your head no if you can. Chapter 5 belongs after chapter 8. Now why God put it in there that way, I don't know. He did it because he wanted to. 
the reason he does all these other things. Now, chapter 8. God represents the Persian Empire as a ram in this chapter. Now, the, this is during the reign of Belshazzar, the Babylonian king. At the very, it's somewhere close to the end of his reign. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was in Shushan, in the palace, which is in the province of, of Elam, I saw in a vision, I was by the river Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. This is Persia. We know this is Persia. When we read the, this is the Persian meat empire, the two horns. So he's calling Persia a two-horned ram. He calls Persia a bear over here. Militarily, it was like a bear. But it's a two-horned ram here. And we know it's a bear here because it's the largest armies. It's two horns because it was composed of the Persians and the Medes. But one horn is longer than the other, and it's more powerful. But he says, two horns, and the two horns were high, and the one was higher than the other. That's because the Persians were stronger than the Medes. Some believe the Medes were the Kurds. Or the Medes, the Kurds are a people that live up here in what we call Georgia, eastern Turkey, and the Kurds were a people that were peopled out of the European continent that moved over here into this area, migrated in this area. And the Kurds are without a, they don't have a land. They all live up here in northern Iran, up in this area, what we call Georgia up in here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And they live in this area up in here, some over in the Turkish area. And they don't have boundary lines, but they do have a king. There's a Kurd that runs the, uh, the, uh, the uh, that Egyptian sandwich. What do you call it? Cairo. Gyro. 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 I think, think they call it really Gyro. But the Gyro, he runs the Gyro down at the farmer's market. And I asked him, I said, you, you do have a, a nation. He said, yes, you have a king, yes. But you don't have any boundaries. He said, that's right, we don't have. Some believe that the Kurds were the Medes, the Medes that had migrated over there. They were Caucasians that had migrated, and they intermarried with the Iranians. Iranians don't look exactly like the rest because they have a lot of different uh, ancestry in their background than some of the other. Well, there's been an intermixture, intermarrying and breeding of all the Arab peoples. Now, let's continue to read. And I saw the ram pushing westward. This is... This is Persia. Persia is going to push westward to conquer the world. That's what they do. Why? What else would they do? <laughs> They're pushing westward to conquer the world. And I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before the Persian Empire. Large armies. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth. Alexander the Great. He's going to come over and he's going to conquer Xerxes and the Persian Empire. And he does it with some of the greatest military stealth that's ever been practiced in warfare. Just a brilliant, brilliant tactician. And was considering, behold, and the he-goat came from the west. Now, we know what the he-goat is because the Bible tells us who it is at the end of this chapter. It's not like I'm some brilliant guy. All you have to do is read all the way through and get to the end of the chapter and say, oh, it'll tell you it's Alexander the Great. It'll call him the first king of that empire. And he was the first king of the empire. His father was Philip of Macedon, but his father never conquered the world. And his father taught him all of his military genius. In fact, Philip should get more credit than just Alexander the Great. And touch not the ground, and the goat had notable horn between his eyes. We know who the horn is. And he came to the ram, had two horns, that's Persia, the Persian Medes, 
which, had, which I had seen standing before the river. Remember, this is the beast. The beast evolves to the beast with iron teeth. And ran at him in the fury of his power, and I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with choler. The word means bitterness. Marar, M-A-R-A-R. means to be vexed. He hated the Persian Empire because they had attacked them some years before unprovoked. So Alexander the Great did not like Xerxes. Moved against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns and there was no power in the ram to stand before him and he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. There was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very strong when he was strong. The great horn was broken. Alexander the Great dies. That's what he's talking about. And for it came up four notable ones. There you are. There's the four generals again. The same four generals that you get in the seventh chapter that it had four heads in verse 6 after Alexander the Great dies. So this is saying the same thing that 7 and 6 is saying. That the the great horn is broken and up came four notable ones. Cassander, Lysacomus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven, and they took over the empire of Alexander the Great. We're talking about the beast rising out of the bottomless pit, out of the place of no knowledge. And the beast is going to rise up at the end of time, and there's going to be no knowledge of God, but they'll say, oh, you can believe in God, you can believe in your truth however you want to, but you can't offend anybody else. We have to be politically correct. We're going to tolerate one another. It amazes me that political correctness is the same thing as the Edict of Milan or the Edict of Toleration in 312 A.D. that Constantine issued. You know how frightening it is to realize political correctness is the very same thing that founded the system? In other words, we have to get along. That's the whole idea of the Council of Foreign Relations, of the Bilderberg Group. It's so all the world can get along economically. Huh? Well, United Nations, it's all the same. It's just an effort on the part of power-structured men of the world to hold on to their money and to rule people. And they say they want to kill off. We, when you go into this study, they've killed off millions, millions. I mean... They, Stalin killed more people than Adolf Hitler killed of his own people in the Ukraine. He killed in the, it's like 60 million. Hitler killed 6 million. 20 million people died during World War II. And when you look at the world, they're killing off people all over the world. They want, I don't know if this is true or not, but they say, These writers say they want the world to be down to a population of 500 million. Half a billion people is all they want in the world. And they'll start killing them off if that's what it takes to survive. Do I believe they'll do that? Well, yeah. Hitler did it. They did it in Rwanda. They killed 300,000 people just in Rwanda alone back in the 90s. They killed them all over the world. Trying to eliminate by by this system now and out of one of them came the fourth little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land or Israel and this is a this is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes coming south to Egypt to attack Egypt then he has to meet with an emissary from Rome on Cyprus, or they called him Chittim, and he met with him, and he said, don't you, drew a circle around him, said, don't you come out of this circle until you promise that you're not going to attack Egypt. And he was, Antiochus was so infuriated, he said, all right, I promise I want to attack Egypt. But he went back and desecrated the temple there in the 11th chapter of Daniel. This is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, and he's the picture of the man of sin. It's called the abomination that makes desolate. There in the 24th chapter of Matthew, the 13th chapter of Mark, and the 21st chapter of Luke. Now, this is, you can put Antiochus Epiphanes outside that. And it waxed great even the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. 
Yea, he magnified himself even the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. That's the sacrifice and the oblation ceasing, isn't it? The oblation is the bread offering that's offered with the daily sacrifice. And you see that in the 11th chapter of Daniel. In the 11th chapter, this is the story of Antiochus in the 11th chapter, where it says in verse 31 of 11, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. That's in 11 and 31. And such as do wickedly, verse 32, against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. He gained the kingdom by flatteries. And the man of sin that rises up at the end of time is going to gain a world system by making all the world like him. Mine sounds like Obama, doesn't it? That man is the smoothest talking human being I think I've ever seen. It's going, if it's not Obama, it's going to be somebody like him or like Bill Clinton. Sounds like Bill Clinton when we get to the end of this chapter. <laughs> and the place his sanctuary was cast down, and host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. He's talking about when Antiochus Epiphanes goes in during that 400 silent years, and he desecrates the temple, and he kills anyone who doesn't want to follow along with the Greek system that he's going to set up. He would actually make the men disrobe if they were circumcised. He'd say, you have to disavow this. And if you don't, you die right where you stand. Then I heard one saint speaking, another saint unto that certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. That's the last three and a half years of time of the last half of the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks. And I'll go into that as we go along. And said unto me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I'll go into that later. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, that behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. Heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. He's talking to Gabriel. It's Gabriel that comes to him in the ninth chapter of Daniel when he says, how long are we going to be over here in Babylon? And the man Gabriel comes to him and says, 70 weeks are determined upon my people and my holy city. So it came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. At the time of the end. Now as he was speaking for me, with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me up right. And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. At the very end of time, when God's rage and fury rises up, ending, he's, he's indignant, he's furious because the world is going after these other gods. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Then he tells us who the two-horned ram is in the next verse. It's not like I was a genius. All you have to do is read the old chapter and you'll know who it is. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. That it? It's pretty simple, isn't it? And we know who overthrew overthrew Media and Persia, Alexander the Great. And the rough goat is the king of Greece. Who is that? Alexander the Great. It's not like it's hard. This is the same system as the line of Barrett Leopard over here in Daniel 7. It's the same as Nebuchadnezzar's image, starting with the head of gold. And the rough goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. And he died and four took over his place. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms, that's the same thing with Alexander's overthrown. That's the four generals that we see there in the eighth chapter, the four that stands up there in, in verse 
uh, 8 of chapter 8, it's the same thing as chapter 7 is the four heads that take Alexander the place, Alexander's place in verse 6. So he says, so he says, the rough goat is the king of Greece. The great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. It'll be the power that God puts upon an evil power that causes him to rise up at the end of time. Now notice verse 23. In the latter end of their kingdom. Of whose kingdom? Of the two-horned ram? Of the goat? What is their kingdom? It's this kingdom here. It's the beast. It's a world-ruling system. A world order. World order. Bilderberg. Trilateral. Who knows? I don't see anything else rising up. These men are the power structure of the world. Bankers. The banks set up the laws. I don't know if you know that. Money men set the laws. They have all the influence in the world with the President of the United States and with Congress. And they meet with them in secret. And these are secret meetings. He says, in the latter end of the kingdom of the beast... When is that? That's at the end of time, right? That's exactly when it is. Because the beast is going to rise up again in the form of tolerance. We'll all get along. We're going to put together the world in one world system, so a new world order, so we can all have good economy. We can get along with each other, and you can't preach against each other, and you certainly can't preach predestination, and Christmas is pagan, and Easter is pagan, and God doesn't love everybody. You cannot preach this. Jim Brown will stop you. You know that, don't you? If they rise up, we, they have a fairness doctrine right now. You cannot call down any other preachers in England or in Canada. You can't do that. It's called the fairness doctrine. They're trying to implement it in America. If they do, they'll stop me from preaching this on TV. I can sit here in this room and preach it. But I cannot be on TV or radio and say anything against anybody else. I can't say that Kenneth Copeland is lying through his teeth and stealing from the poor, even if he is. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, when God says, when this thing is full up to here with me, that's when he says, my fury will come up in my face. When I destroy Gog, that's another name for the man of sin. And we'll get into that. When the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, a man of sin, a world-ruling leader is going to rise up. A king of fierce countenance, understanding dark sentences. Ooh-wee. The word dark sentences is the word kidah. C-H-I-Y-D-A-H. Puzzling questions. What are the puzzling questions? How are we going to fix war and rumors of wars, sword? How are we going to fix famine, economy? How are we going to fix pestilence? We got more pestilence. Rising pestilence, disease. How are we going to fix AIDS? How are we going to fix Ebola? How are we going to fix all these diseases that are rising so fast in the world? You know that diseases do not die. They hibernate. We've still got the bubonic plague. We've still got the black plague. There was a, there was a out in New Mexico back 10, 12 years ago. It came up out of the nowhere, the bubonic plague. It just goes and hibernates until someone peels the top off of it off of a, trying to tear down the rainforest to build land. They, there was, they were doing that down in South America and these people in this town started dying. Boom, 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 boom. Just would be, get sick, dead in two days. 
And they came down there and found out the reason they were, they were dying was because they were peeling this off the, peeling the land off and they were taking the habitat of these mice and these rats out there who were carrying deadly diseases to human. But as long as they left it alone, everything was fine. They didn't come in contact with humans. But once they started peeling this off, I, this is in a book that I've called uh, Coming Plague. And once they started clearing the land out to build houses and make money and things and stuff, the mice and the rats started going into their food supplies and urinating in their bags of corn. And the people were eating it and dying it in two days, dying in a couple of days. Uh, and they had one lady tell me that she worked in a, out here at Vanderbilt and she worked in the labs out there and she was testing various things. She said diseases are coming through here so fast we cannot keep up with them. Center of Disease Control down in Atlanta will tell you that. So what he's going to have the answer to, it is the beast that's going to have the answer to these things here. He's, it's going to be the man of sin or the king of fierce countenance and he's going to rise up at the end of time. It's going to be ahead of the world ruling system of the world order. We're headed for something really bad, people. But it's not bad for us that believe God. It's good for us, isn't it? I'll be glad to see it done. And he says, goes on to say, The king of fierce countenance will understand these puzzling questions, hard questions that cannot be answered, that the world is saying, We've got to have, how are we going to take care of our economy? And some charming man, head of the United Nations, Bill Clinton wants to be Secretary General of the United Nations. You know that, don't you? Now this, now this next few verses sounds like Bill. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. It will be by Satan. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper. And practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people and through his policy, seek hell, intelligence, through his intelligence, his knowledge, his sense of understanding political world situations, he shall cause craft to prosper. The word craft is the word mirma. He shall cause deception to prosper. If there's anybody that causes deception to prosper, it's Bill Clinton. He can lie about his wife. He can cheat on her. Of course, if I was married to Hillary, I'd probably cheat on her too. <laughs> no, I was just kidding. She is a, she is a fruitcake. She's, Dick Morris likes to go after her. I've got several books by Dick Morris and. He nails that woman. He says she lies when the truth would be better. She just likes to lie. When the World Trade Center came down, she said Chelsea was jogging around the World Trade Center when it happened. And Chelsea came on TV about two months later and said, I was across town watching the World Trade Center come down. Now, why would she have her jogging around the World Trade Center when she was across town in New York looking from five miles away? I mean... <laughs> yeah, she said they were over there under fire. They were, it, they were under fire in the Middle East when that helicopter landed and they were welcoming her and shaking her hands. But nobody's shooting at Hillary. And Dick Morris said that Dick, Dick Morris likes, he goes after everybody, Republicans and Democrats. I like to read Dick because he's funny. And he said that she was going to identify with black people. And she said, I just want to identify with, with people who have been persecuted because. I was persecuted when I was in high school and I was playing badminton or something and this other girl said, I don't like you. <laughs> Isn't that funny? She's such an idiot. And said, Nick Morris said he went back and researched and said that school didn't even have that game when she was going there. She, she likes to lie. And I think Bill has to put up with that all the time. Well, he, he can run around and chase women, and he causes craft to prosper, doesn't he? Uh, he causes his deception. Because everybody says, well, Bill running around with all these women. Yeah, but we like him. We don't care. Let's vote for him. And I'll tell you what. 
If they'd let him run again, he'd be president. You know that. He was liked that much. People don't care. And one, one person said, we don't care what he does with his family as long as he does right by America. You mean if he'll cheat on his wife, he won't cheat on America? <laughs> Great day. All right. Do I have any time? All right. And through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper. This will be the head of the world system. Somehow, if we get a North American Union, and they're fighting for it. There's, they've tried to, some have tried to quell it, but we have the problem with the borders. They're wanting to eliminate the borders of Mexico, eliminate the borders of Canada, where everybody can come and go. Of course, the whole idea of that is to get one system in the Americas and then get one system in Europe, then amalgamate them together and get one system in Asia, and then we can have a world government and everybody can get along because somebody will be ruling it. It'll be the heads, it'll be the money, the heads of state and the money people and the power structure people of the world. And that's what it's about. It's about these four. God says, he says, I'll send the sword, the fame, and the pestilence. These are the answers, aren't they? Huh? When you see the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you see the first one wearing, riding a white horse. Always the kings of empires rode white horses. So that's the beast. You see the second one riding a red horse, and he's got a sword in his hand. There's the sword. There's the beast, the sword. You, this is in the sixth chapter of Revelation. You see the third one riding a, riding a black horse, and he's got scales in his hand, saying a measure of wheat for a penny, penny and, three, uh, and three measures of barley for a penny. Barley was the poor man's food. Wheat was the wealthy man's food. He's showing, and a penny was a denarius. That was the, that was the amount of money that a slave laborer or a soldier would make in a day. He's saying it's take, take a full day's wages to buy enough to feed one man. He's talking about famine with the black horse, so you got the sword. The famine, you got the beast. And the third horse will be a pale horse. And death and hell and pestilence will ride with him. So you got the four horsemen of the apocalypse are the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. And if you don't see that all through the Old Testament, and this is the answers that the man of sin is going to have. When you see the man of sin, man of sin is the same as the king of fierce countenance. He's the same thing as Gog. And the land of Gog was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. That was the land of the Caucasians, the Caucasus. Caucasus Mountains. Gog. Caucasus. They just hardened the, the... They just simply hardened the consonant. Gog. We get the word Caucasus from that. Gog. They call their high points Gog. And they named their... They call their mountains Magog. And they call the highest points Gog. And they named their leaders after the highest points of their mountains. And that was the Assyrian Empire, the Caucasian Empire, the most barbaric people who ever lived. It's not black people. It's not Indians. It's not red people. These are the people who invented all the torture that the American Indian used. It was white people that did that. And that's the truth. <coughs> Would you like it or not? All right. That's the truth. And then he goes on to say, that's what what's your name would say. What was, what was her name? With, with time. And through his policy he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart. Whoo By peace shall destroy many. We're going to have peace in the world. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them that travails upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We're heading right into eternity, people. And America is deaf and blind to what's going on. The preachers are dumber than a bunch of rocks. Aren't they? Amen. You think any preachers know anything about this? No. So, DBN, the Devil's Broadcasting Network, a Baptist preacher out of Garland, Texas, went on there and Paul Crouch was, was interviewing him, pastored 5,000 people on Sunday morning. And Paul Crouch said, Paul Crouch is a lying false teacher. And Paul said, what's your take on the Middle Eastern situation? And this Baptist preacher said, well, prophecy is not my forte. And it made me so mad when he said that. I yelled at this TV, well, what is your fort? 
Not my forte, you pastor 5,000 people. You don't know nothing about prophecy? What an ignoramus. Kill that man. Throw him out of the church. Disgusting false teacher. I couldn't believe it. That's not my forte. If you don't understand prophecy, you'll know nothing about the Old Testament. You'll know nothing about the kings. You'll know nothing about the promise of God. You'll know nothing about the covenant. You don't know anything about the gospels. Just infuriated me that a man will stand up and call himself a preacher and say nothing. When you see this king of fierce countenance, he is Gog of the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. He is this man of sin in the second chapter of of Second Thessalonians. Look over there. This is the man of sin. And the beast rises out of the pit. Do you think Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, as Hal Lindsey says, wrote it out of a nuclear explosion in the ninth chapter of Revelation? They didn't have nuclear warheads when Babylon started in Genesis 11. Golly. Does that... Is, you know how disgusted I get listening to these guys preach? I have spent 57 years studying prophecy. No small amount of time. Researching, digging, 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 year after year, decade after decade. And these guys are idiots. People say, don't call them idiots. Well, if they weren't idiots, I wouldn't call them that. <laughs> Hal has no he has no more business teaching prophecy than one of my dogs has a preaching prophecy. I think Cowboy's got more business preaching prophecy than he does. At least Cowboy won't lie. He'll go, woof. <laughs> and that's the truth. You know. God, deliver us from these fools. So why do you get mad at them? I, wouldn't get, I don't get mad at somebody not knowing the truth. That's not the point. The point is somebody who doesn't know anything about what they're talking about, and they stand on a platform and look into a TV camera and say, these scorpions are helicopters, and this is a nuclear explosion. You dumbbell. That just infuriates me for somebody to lead sheep away with something they don't know. And I, doesn't that bother you? Most of y'all have come to me and said, after I come here a while, I started, you told me, you said, I got mad at my preacher that I used to go to. Didn't you tell me that, Judy? You said, I got mad. I found out he didn't know anything. Preachers don't know nothing. We're living in the apostasy. We're living in a time that, why do you think I get frustrated? Why do I get mad at these guys? Because they're leading you astray. We're not leading people at grace and truth astray, but there's a lot of people following those guys. And they don't know nothing about what they're talking about. I don't mind if you don't know. I don't even mind if a preacher don't know, but don't say you do and then stand up and start teaching some idiocy and then lead people to believe that. And you see here in verse chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin... The king of fierce countenance is going to be revealed. But he's going to be revealed at the end of time. He's going to be revealed when Christ comes back in flaming fire. In chapter 1, verse 8, taking vengeance on all those that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That's the same time factor as verse 1 of chapter 2. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him in the air. Gathering together is, is episunagoge. It means to superimpose the synagogue or the gathering together of God in the air with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But that'll be at the end when He's revealed. When apocalypto, when the cover is taken off. He's not going to be revealed at the beginning of a tribulation. Man of sin, the king of fierce countenance comes on world scene to lead us into a, a world peace. You're not going to announce that in the paper. I'm out of time, ain't I? And he's the king of fierce countenance. That's another king of fierce countenance, man of sin. And he's got several other names, God. And Judas was called the same thing in the 17th chapter of John. We're going to come back and we're going to continue in this. If you'll notice, the beast comes out of the pit. 
I'm going to come back to the scorpions coming out of the pit next week or the locusts coming out of the pit. We need to see this whole picture. Once you see the whole picture, you'll kind of know what's going on. I challenge you to go online. Look up Bilderberg. Look up Trilateral Commission. Look up Council on Foreign Relations. Look up North American Union. Look up European Union. Look up Asian Union. You're not going to believe what you're going to come up with. There's one section on here. And this guy goes through it. Now, I'm not saying I agree with everything they're saying as far as conspiratorial planning. Do I believe it's a conspiracy? If they're planning behind closed doors, it's a conspiracy. Do I believe they think they're doing good? Yeah, I think they think they're doing good, but it's still a conspiracy. Conspiracies are not always evil on the part that, of the man that's conspiring. He thinks he's doing good. There's one section. It's 98 pages. This guy goes through a little bit of everything. And it's who's who in the elite. Who's who of the elite? What elite have done to America and how to fix it? They think it, they think it can be fixed and it can't because God says it's not going to be fixed. He's going to see to it that it happens. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. God, help us to see these things. Something's about to happen. Give strength to the sheep. Lord, make the flock strong. Something worldwide, it looks like it's about to come about. And Lord, we need your strength as we go into this situation. Lord, you said we're not to think of what we'll answer, that the Holy Spirit will, will give us words when they bring us before magistrates. You said you told us that they'll think they do you service when they put us to death. Lord, I'm anxious for you to come back. And rescue your family. Thank you for truth. Strengthen the flock. Lead us to elect. In Jesus' name, amen.